Welcome back. Today we will look more into multivariate models, in particular how to estimate multivariate ARIMA models. So we will focus a lot of the time on the so-called ARIMA package that we have here. And then we'll do a lot of time on doing some examples and to, you can say, to understand the theory behind the ARIMA package, package, here is the reference that you have here a fast estimation method for the vector autoregressive moving average model with exogenous variable by Henrik Splin. It's in the journal for the American Statistical Association and it back in December 1983. And here's also a link that you can use to get it. So I actually want to spend most of the time focusing on that. So to explain how the Marima model is working, I will do two things. First, I'll just look through this document, which is the vignette that comes with the Marima package in R. It shows you an example, and then as an exercise, I'll guide you through another example. So what we can do, we can work with multivariate ARMA and ARMAX models. It's a little bit about, uh, picky about how to um, organize different models uh, data. We're talking about the operator form, which we also used in other places in the course. And then there's a lot of things to how to handle things in Marima. It's nice to understand so you know what you get. It's always nice when you have potentially seasonal modeling to be able to do different things. If you have long time lagging, you can consider doing something different that more helping the estimation algorithms. Then something about model selection and then using a case study. Now the case study I will do not so much in here, but also represented in R to show you how things run along. So basically for an introduction, what we have to do with here, we have a multivariate state Y and then what we often in this course is called epsilons, the disturbances are called U's here. But then you have the usual ARIMA model structure here. And then if you go down to the AMAX model, well, the only thing that you add is that you add some exogenous input X's here. Compared to what we have often done, it's placed on the left hand side. You can see later why that is done so. So, organization of time series for Marima. So, how do we have things? Here, if you have n observations of k variables, how you should organize them is by having k rows and n columns. So, you don't have one row is one observation, but you have one column is one observation. Memory-wise, calculation-wise, that's more efficient internally. So, what Marima now does is, if you provide something that has the wrong ordering, it will transpose it for you. But internally, you work with column. Each column is a time point, and then it's a state vector you have standing there. So you have a column vector, which is not one of the reasons why it's nice to work with. Now, the operator form in Marima is quite similar to what we have looked at in the other part of this time series course. We have the backward shift operator. We have a, an autoregressive part here of order p. So you have coefficients up to this lag. Likewise, you have for the moving average part, you have up to q coefficients there. And of course, an uppercase i is an identity matrix of the appropriate dimension. So, and for the Armax model, you have this notation here for the armor model. For the armor model, basically what you do is that you add an extra element here. So you have not just the states here, but you also have the predictors and you effectively, you extend the state vector with the corresponding predictors. And then you take care of and handling which coefficients belongs to what and so forth. We will get back to that in more detail with the example. 
So, if you have an average in the model like this, there are basically two ways that you can write this. You can either subtract the average of the system once and for all, and then model that, or you can have a mean value inside the model here. Again, it's a technical thing, but sometimes you have mean adjusted, sometimes you don't. So what is the conclusion here? Well, it's basically when you want to reconstruct things, if you want to do things manually, you have to keep track of how you do things in here. One thing that I think is good to know is when you treat these polynomials in powers of b, then sometimes you have to inverse them. And what we discussed previously is when you invert such a polynomial, it may get infinite order. But what we've also seen is when you get to a certain order, well, then it's not, the coefficient gets very small. So we can approximate it by a finite length. And that's what we're doing here. So it's convenient to write it where you just have a so-called psi form, where you just have coefficients, so everything is written as a moving average part. There's no autoregressive part left here. So given this model, the challenge is how to calculate this inverse. I said it's of infinite order, but what we will do in here is that we'll try to approximate this and see how close that we get. So having a, an armor model on this form, where you multiply by the inverse of the phi, then some will call this a random shock form, but effectively, as we discussed in the previous lectures, this is also, you can say, the impulse response. That's another word for the random shock form. So it will have infinite length, but in practice you have to just keep a finite history. The rest is about stability, that's the same as we looked at many cases before. Now, how to kind of keep matrices in here? So when we have dependent variables and we have regression variables, we need to have all those in here. And we have the order of the polynomials in here. So what we have is that we have dependent variables and we have regression variables as the first two dimensions. And then we have coefficients as the third dimension. So you have like zero is the first part in the third dimensional structure. That matrix there will just be the identity matrix to have a leading term of unity. And then you have the lag one dependencies as the second lag for the, in this case, up to lag P, which represents an AR structure. But again, we'll get back to this in an example, but just keep in mind that parameters are stored in a three dimensional arrays. So the third dimension gives you the time lag and the first two dimension gives you the matrix that we usually have, so the phi zero to phi p up there. Now, doing this inverse of polynomial, we have a function called pulls dot inverse of phi, and then you do that up to lag l. So you specify, in this case, how good do you want this approximation to be? Often it doesn't have to be that good in order to produce something that is useful. Um, you can also you have the multiplication of polynomials, uh, sorry, the inversion of here, but you can also multiply polynomials. Again, when you multiply polynomials, you also get terms of higher order. So again, you specify which polynomials to multiply and to what order you want to keep that. And the resulting order is 1 plus L because you always have the leading term of an in uh, identity matrix. So that was briefly about that. What is, you could say, interesting is if you first do the inverse of phi 
and then pre multiply on theta, then you get the psi formulation up to the eld order that you define. And it's typical to use the same order here and there. Another classical example is, well, what you want to do is that if you take the inverse here and multiply it by the non-inverse, you should expect to get the identity matrix, followed by five zero matrices. If everything works out, of course, you can try it for numerical purposes. And maybe this is the time to start rolling things in R. A matrix of random coefficients here. So I have them organized here, just in random numbers. I did not have a leading term of, of, with the identity matrix there, but Molima functions will always check if it's there and then add it. So we'll do the inverse, keeping up to the fifth order elements there, and then we will multiply the inverse with the non-inverse. And then let's have a look at what we get. Scroll up here. We get indeed an identity matrix here at the leading term. The second here, which is corresponding to lag one, are just zeros, lag two, zeros, if it goes to lag three, all of a sudden we got some non-zero values, but they're very, very small. Likewise, for the remaining lags here, we're down to at least 10 to the minus 15, so we got quite small numbers. So the effective order of this, when you say that you have effective 12 significant difference, is a zero order as should be expected. So we can say that we just subtract and only keep what is actually significant in here, and then we're left with just the identity matrix. Now, let's get back to the presentation here. So the differencing when you have a multivariate time series. One of the things here to keep in mind is that you can make different differencing of the different states. So if you have, as a fourth dimensional system, you may want to do differencing of the first and the second, but not the third and the fourth. So we need to find a way to do this. It may also want to be that you want to do second order differencing of one of them. So how do we do this? We will use the usual different operator, the density minus b, to do it if you want to do something for all of them. But for, uh, for a simple single one, you have yt minus yt minus 1. For univariate case, and in a multi, in a bivariate case, if you do it for all, well, you have the identity matrix, and you have minus the identity matrix times p. And you can write it as this. And again, as we've done for the univariate series, if you look at the inverse of this, it becomes an infinite sum because the summation operator is the inverse of the difference operator. Sometimes, yes, as said before, you want to difference twice, and if you multiply this whole thing with itself, you will see that you get yt minus 2, yt minus 1, plus yt minus 2. So that's what you want to do. Now, sometimes you also want to do seasonal differencing, which is similar, except that what you subtract is not just lagged one step backwards in time, but lagged S step, S corresponding to the se season. And sometimes you want to do, as said initially, mixed differencing. So you want to have, say, one series lag to season one and the other one to season two, where one of the seasons may be just season one to just be ordinary differencing. So what Marima is quite flexible regarding this. There is a defined a diff function that can perform mixed differencing of the various things. And then you have defined dot sum that does the reverse in order to get back to the, you can say, original domain. So how to do differencing using this function? That's what we're getting to look at now. And the user will specify this Say in a particular bivariate case, we want to do 
two times differencing of the first date, a second order differencing of the first date, and we want to do a seasonal differencing of the second state with lag 12. So how to give that? Now, what you do, you have an argument that says differencing. The first row here indicates the state, and the second order indicates the lag at which to do differencing. So what this means is that you first do first difference lag a state 1 with lag 1, then you do it again. And if you do that twice, what you have is second order differencing. So now you're done with that. And then you do the second state, you do that differencing at lag 12. So in our code, you can write it as a matrix like this. Typically, I prefer to bind it in different ways. So you bind the columns here, say this one with that one, this one with that one, and so forth. The important thing is to have this structure here. When you then use to find a diff, then you get the difference time series out and a bit more that you can use to get back. So as an example of the above, maybe we should again get straight to R instead. No, I did not copy that one part over here. Let me just copy this. Cleaning up a few things. Okay, so what the example is, for differencing, again, we will just create, in this case, we just create some data. So we had 24 observations of the bivariate process in this case. And then we'll define the different operator as before. Let's look at it. It has 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, and 12 there. So that was what we just wanted to do. We just use the define the diff function of the data and then with this different operator. Then this contains the difference data, what was lost in transactions, so to speak, because there's some first elements that we cannot use when we do differencing of up to like order 12. Well, then we have to disregard the first observations. Averages of the model of the series that are subtracted. And let's just look at it. So these are the difference data. And notice that we don't have 24 anymore. We have 12 because the first 12 we used to create the differences. Those are the ones that we have here. And then if you look at the difference operator here as a polynomial, well, what do we have? Let's go up to the beginning of this. We have at like zero, a density matrix. And then since we're going to do second order differencing, then it's minus two times yt minus two, and then plus yt minus sorry, y, yt minus 1, and then plus yt minus 2, as we saw. Scroll back up here. Where was that? That was exactly what we have here. So we have a 1, a minus 2, and a 1 for lags 0, 1, and 2. That's what we have, a 1, a minus 2, and a 1. Now for these other state, the second state, we have a 1 here, and then we have just zeros all the way down to here. To give you, to remembering that element 13 is lag 12. So that's exactly what we expected to have. And then it also extract the averages. In this case, they are small values because we just took some random normal values. Let's get back here. We were doing this differencing example that we just looked at there. So we can also write it on, you can say, vector form, 
on the following form here. So the first part here, we have the leading identity matrix, and then we subtract only in the first state for b to the first power, and only in the third state for b to the second power, and then b to the twelfth power only for the second state. So this is a, lo a larger representation of the same model that we have, have up here. So this is a nice model for input. It's not so easy to actually read what it means sometimes, but at least it's more compact than this. And that's what we have to live with. So this is the differencing. If you have non stationary models, well, well, that's when you start to do differencing of one of the more states. That is the same thing you do here as you do for univariate cases, so I won't spend much time on it, but it's basically just the same thing. You define some differencing, and then you do that. Now, what we get to now is this. What we care about is the Marima function that's going to do the actual estimation. So dy dot diff contains the difference data, and then you give arguments representing the AR and MA parts that you want to include, and some more stuff out there, which we will get back to at a later point in time. And then when you want to get back, you can multiply the estimated AR coefficient from the difference model with a different polynomial up to the order that is appropriate, say what is the dimension of the AR part, and then also what is the maximum lag in the AR part, and the third dimension in the different polynomial. Now, not too much more about the aggregate model. You can go through and look at the differencing here. If you want to do long-term lagging, long-term means you want to depend on something that is a long time backwards in time when you do the modeling, the estimation may not work as nice. So what you may consider doing if you want to make something that depends on y1, a long time period back in time, is to add that as a third variable in the system here. Then you just have to make sure later on that you don't estimate the same parameters for this as you have up there, but you can introduce it as an extra parameter. It means that you have to kind of keep track of what you're doing. So you have to say, take the season minus one in here when you subtract it, because you will be later on depending on the state at t minus one. So therefore you get the extra minus one that you need at that point in time. I won't spend much time on this. It's something that you can play with if you find that it's needed, but otherwise just make it work. The important thing is, if you do this, don't estimate all the parameters, only estimate those parameters that are appropriate. If you want to create these seasonal lagging, there's also a helping function for doing so, but I will skip past this. What I find is the more important thing is the model selection in Marima, how to define the model in the Marima and also in the Marima with exogenous input. So we're looking at the so-called defined out model, which is a helper function to give you the right matrices of the right forms, telling you what to estimate. Basically, you have to give a matrix with AR pattern that includes ones where you want to estimate a parameter and zero where you do not want to estimate a parameter. So then you have elements i comma j comma and then the order plus one back in time. That's the dimension of what you're estimating. Likewise for the moving average part. So in our, there's an example, but I think I'll show you an example in a moment from the R code from a different version of this document. So basically what is done internally is that the linear model selection is used. 
Rodina model is used to estimate parameters in a pure regression model that is based, and then since you cannot take an armor model in general and write it as a linear regression model. You do it once and then you use residuals for that as input and predictors in the next model. And then by repeatedly doing that, it will most often converge. And now if you have an LM, you have coefficients that are non-significant, so you can use a step function that is using an AIC, but as criteria default, namely the penalty equals to two. We get back to that, I think, First, we should go down and do the case study, and then we'll discuss how that works. So this is a study about the Australian firearm legislation. <coughs> so it's the effect of that. So you have different debt wa rates in Australia, and there was a new legislation put in place in 1997. And in 2007, they had taking the time to investigate these by doing some models, and they found that AMA 1,1 models could be adequate in this case. So, <clears throat> what we're looking at here are dead rates fire by firearms and suicides, firearm and homicides, and then you have other suicides and suicide by other means than firearms, and you have other kinds of homicides not using firearms. So how were those different rates affected by the firearm legislation? So the data goes back to year 1915, and then you have the rates per some per inhabitants, but I don't know, forgot the exact denominator. Um, doesn't really matter. We have, so how many produce a suicide per, say, 100,000? Then, the last two columns out here will, are related to the legislation, which was put in place in 1997, and then due to the lag one thing, it's put in place once before. And then the, the accumulative legislation gives you years past the institution of legislation. Then the data ends with the last observation is in year 2004. But in order to do predictions, we have added 10 more rows where we just have the predictors included here. So that's one thing that is a little bit different in Marima. You have to allocate the place with some NAs where you want these predictions to be. Now, first of all, we just want to look at doing the same thing as was done in the original papers. Just look at the four variant time series. And I have a lot of code here. First, go to the library, get the data in here say we only want to use the so-called old data before introduction of the legislation, we want to have an AR1, an MA1 coefficient. If you want to have an AR2 model, then you should write both a 1 and a 2 in order to get both lag 1 and lag 2. So you have to specify all the orders that you want, and of course the same thing applies for the moving average part. So if you just specify a 2 here, you do not, you get an AR2 model where the AR1 term is fixed to zero. We have a seven dimensional system here because we have the years in the first column. So what we'll do is remove variables one, six, and seven. And at first, to estimate the univariate models, we will say that variables two to five are independent. And then we'll run the Marima model, include the mean values, have the AR pattern that comes out from defined that model, and likewise the moving average part from there. We won't use a penalty, and not do any plotting for now. But let's go to R and see if we have the same thing here. Save all the data, take the old data, define that we want a first order model, 
Let's just have a look at what the output of the fine model is. So in this case, we have the AR pattern. The first here is always an identity matrix. And the second matrix here indicates which parameters to estimate. So we have, since they are independent, we have in a diagonal here of ones, and everything else is zero. Those are the corresponding to the different rates, suicide, uh, homicide rates. And for the MA part is, in this case, identical. Now let's estimate it. And I will plot the log of the determinant of what comes out, just which is a good measure of convergence. So what we see here is we start at some value. It doesn't matter if it goes up or down so much. What is of importance is that it converges to something stationary within. So here, in this case, around 20 iterations was sufficient to get close to the true value. Let's look at what we got out. There's a function called short term, which will kind of not display the leading identity matrix. Just to show you what you care about, you care about the AR one term here. So we have a diagonal here of parameters. Likewise for the moving average part. Right now, I won't discuss the particular value so much. But what I want to is to say, well, we don't have any independent variables. We'll still remove the first six and seven that are the year and the legislation effect. But we will make a full model, which means that we both for the AR and MA part here, for the AR part, we have a block matrix of ones in here. And everything else is zero. So now we will estimate all these parameters, 16 there and 16 here. Let's go ahead and estimate this. It went quite fast, I would say. Again, it does a small thing here, but it also converges nicely within roughly 20 observations, so everything is behaving nice. Let's look at the coefficients. We get coefficients here in this 4x4 four four matrix here. Again, I won't discuss the actual numerical values. It's a lot of negative values, you can say here. So that means that this is formulated on the left-hand side of the uh, equal sign, which means you, when you move it to the right-hand side, they become positive. So you have 0 0.6 times the previous. That's the model that you get here. If you look, And in particular, the last kind of homicide here is almost the same value as the previous one. If you look at the moving average coefficients, again, we have the same region here. Now, what we want to do now is to say, does the, what happens if we include the legislation? So the regression variables. What we discussed that we were doing then, if we go back, I'll scroll up and find the appropriate place. That was the seasonal. Here we go. If you have the AMAC structure, then what we said earlier on is that you add the predictors to the state or the regression variables, and then you add some coefficients here. Now the dimension of this, of course, matches there, but then we need to pad some zeros underneath here to get a square matrix as we have over here. So now we'll only remove the first variable and we will treat variables six and seven as regression variables. Let's look at the structure. Ah. Let us look at the structure of this. So first the MA part, leading identity, like one is a four by four matrix. If you go up to the AR1, you have a leading identity matrix, and then you have, compared to before, you have the four by four, but then you have added these two out here. And sorry for running some more code, just as a typo in here. Let's now estimate these additional eight parameters in here. 
I'm plotting again, and what we see down here is that again it converges nicely, so not much to discuss right there. Let's look at what we estimated. We got some estimate for the AR parts here. What should be noticed is that some of these coefficients are very small. It also applies in here some places, but we haven't looked at the uncertainty of these yet. We'll get back to that. The moving average part is again a 4 by 4 matrix of coefficients that are estimated. Everything, all the zeros out there are non-estimates. Now, if we use the default penalty function in Marima, what do we get then? What the defined model here is the same here. Now, well, I forgot to mention that. When we go to all data, of course, then we need more data in here. We will again, here we will use, sorry, the penalty equals two is the only difference here compared to the previous one. So what you will see here is that the convergence here looks quite a bit different from before because what it does is that it runs the first one third of the iterations here, so around 17, and then it uses the step function to use AIC to reduce the model, and then at each following observation, uh, iteration, it will try to remove one variable at a time and see what happens from there. Now, if we look at the coefficients that we estimated here, we see that before we had this full block here to be estimated, but now we get a lot of zeros in here. For the AR part, what you will notice is that it's kind of difficult when you have these zeros here, is that you have something in diagonal there, nothing depends on the third one here, then you have a diagonal there, and you have a diagonal element there. So the third state here depends on the first kind of homicides and pretty much nothing else. So that's one thing if you look at the moving average part. Well, then we have, we would say, again, a lot of zeros, but we still also have quite some elements that are non-zero. If we look at the output of the model, Marina 4 here, it contains quite a bit of information. What we look at are just the AR estimates and MA estimates. We have them up here. We also have the corresponding F values for each of those. Those are the ones that are used when comparing to the penalty. And then we have the call that AR pattern, what came in. And then we have the out MA and AR and MA pattern, as in after removing those that are non-significant by the penalty, what do we get to? And then a lot of all the other different settings that are in here, also the residual covariance structure, what are the fitted values, fitted, and so forth. So there's a lot of information out here that you can dig out. If you look at the F statistics, here again, I just included the leading unity matrix that is always there. And you see that everything that is left is highly significant. And also when you look at the MA part here, we also see that everything that is left is significant, except you say this one is, I would say, borderline 2.03, is close to be non-significant. So that is how things are. And I think one of the things that happens when you do the penalty in this way is that when you start, the first bit here is fine, it converts nicely. Now what you do here is that you start removing things, but at, you do not allow it to converge before you remove the next variable. You take, you remove one coefficient here at each further iteration, and then at some point it just is sufficient. And if you have too many um, uh, things that you want to remove, of course then you need to just go further in time, but the fact is that 
except for the first time or the subsequent times, it may not have converged to the actual value, which means that the F statistics will not be the same, which means that you may actually remove variables that are not the ones that were least significant at the point in time. So what I've done is that I've made a step that's slow, that runs to convergence, uh, runs the 50 iterations, and then pick one variable, and then run with that again. So when I run this, what would happen is that I run the Morima function one at a time, and each time I run a new one is because I'm removing one element. And the default up here, oh, that's not in there, is again to use a penalty of two. So now I got a model, and if I look at the short term of the slow step, for the AR part here, it's quite a bit different from what we saw before. Maybe I should just print that. So the first thing to notice is where do we have non-zero elements? And where we before saw that for the third one here didn't mean anything, actually now when we do things a little bit more uh, carefully, you actually get elements that are non-zero in three of these terms. Likewise, out here, there's one more that should be included, whereas for x4, well, it's almost invariant. For x5, well, you get one more element from x7. You actually get fewer elements, and for x7, it's about the same, also about the same numerical value. So it does matter how we do things, and I would always, if you have the time, run step slow to make sure that you do not throw things away things that are actually significant. Now, we've got a model. Given the model, we need to do some various things. One thing that I'll skip just right now is the analysis of the residuals. I'll show you that in another part, how to do that. Um, right now, I will just show you how to do forecasts in here. We take all the data, all the rows, we will use the first 90 to kind of converge to the right place, and then we'll step 10 steps forward using the step slow model that we got from just before. Maybe we should just print all the data to remind ourselves that up to year 2004, that's where we have data, and then we want to predict the future. So everything that happens from here on, first we do the prediction, it just prints the model and a lot of other things. Maybe we don't need to look so much at that. But what we do want to care about is to make a plot that shows you things. The first things I'll just go through. We have the square root of the prediction variances here. And then we look at the prediction plus standard deviation times 1.96 to get a prediction interval upper and lower. We bind that together and just show you. You see, this code could be written in many ways. I have copied what was in the PDF file further down here. There's a lot more plots in the PDF file that you can look at when you do it yourself. So now let's just plot what we have out here. So this is how things happened. The rate of armed suicides, which dropped quite a bit after the legislation here. That was the data. The first one with the line there are the one-step predictions. Now, just a grid, just to make it easy to find your way around it. Now, what we want to care about are the predictions into the future from year 2005 to 14, And then we will do at lines, one for the prediction, one for the hour limit, one for the lower limit, and just mark that's where we started doing predictions. So that is 
you can take the usual story about doing a 95% prediction interval. That was all I wanted to do for showing you how Marima works. You can go through the document here and add some more words to it, but basically it's the same story that I've been through here with a lot of different example and code and numbers going through that. Also comparing some models, what is significant, what is not, by say looking at how much of the variance is explained and other things, but I think the most important thing is the model development and make sure that when you do reduce the models, first of all you should do that, but second of all, make sure that you do it slowly so you make sure that the model converges before you remove the next variable.